My name is Monica Gandhi and today I'll be talking about a case-based approach to comorbidities in HIV infection. I have no conflicts of interest to report. Today we'll talk about some old and some new and emerging comorbidities. We'll talk about weight gain with antiretroviral therapy and metabolic effects. We'll talk about pregnancy and breastfeeding and what to do there. And we'll talk a little bit about simplification. So in terms of case number one, a 43-year-old man comes into your practice with two years of virologic suppression on bitegravir, tenofovir, alafenamide, and FTC. He was diagnosed with HIV in 2015 and started an integrase inhibitor-based regimen then, but then he was switched to his one pill insti based regimen in 2018. He has no past medical history, but he just started a new fitness regimen, and he's, quote, irritated, I cannot lose my middle. Patient has had weight gain of about eight pounds over the past three years, no past medical history or concomitant medications. So it is true that um, we have had some very interesting evidence over the last really two years about the effects of both TAF and integrase inhibitors on the possibility of both weight gain, obesity, and even metabolic effects. Really what started us on this route was the advanced trial that uh, is now um, out to 144 weeks. But remember the advanced trial was to look at the combination of dolotegavir TAF FTC versus dolotegavir TDF FTC versus a Favarin's TDF F uh, FTC in resource limited settings. And this was really to look at the efficacy and all three regimens are efficacious, but then the safety data became very interesting. And the safety data as revealed in the AIDS 2020 presentation from July of this year, looks like there is continuing weight gain in really all three arms, but most notably in the dolotegravir TAF arm. And that weight gain actually differs by sex. So that if you look at men, there is a weight gain over time, but then it ends up plateauing. But this is data out to 144 weeks with women. And as you can see on the right hand panel, women looks like as we keep on going with the advanced trial, the weight gain is not plateauing. And it's not just weight gain with that combination of TAF and dolotegravir, less so with TDF and dolotegravir, but still some there. It's not just the weight gain, but there are other data from this trial that show that true obesity with a BMI of greater than 30 are much higher with the combination of dolotegravir and TAF. And this really launched many investigations into looking at other cohorts, observational cohorts and so forth, to look at what is the effect of these different regimens, especially INSTEs com combined with TAF on weight gain. And here you can see a pooled analysis across eight randomized phase three clinical trials. This was published in CID last year, where it really looks like the orange line, again, the INSTEs are the regimen that's most associated with weight gain, more than proteus inhibitors with NNRTIs on the bottom in terms of the least effect on weight gain. And then if you look on the right-hand panel, just NRTIs alone, again, TAF is emerging as most associated with weight gain in these randomized trials as opposed to the other NRTIs. And then uh, very recent data from AIDS 2020 in July of this year, looked at the OPERA study. And the OPERA study was really a longitudinal prospective cohort analysis that collected data on over 115,000 individuals living with HIV across the United States and Puerto Rico. And really the uh, look here was just to look at people who were um, in terms of their weight gain aspect in these observational cohorts. There was um, quite a few because it's become first line of individuals on INSTEs. 3,281, then there were some on NNRTIs and boosted PIs. And here is really the main data slide of this analysis that specifically the investigators set out to just look at the effects of switching from TDF to TAF um, while maintaining the backbones that I mentioned, integrase inhibitors, PIs, and NNRTIs. And you can see across all three of these figures that when TDF was switched to TAF, there is an increase in weight gain um, across all three classes, but actually most prominent uh, with the INSTEs, but there's weight gain as can be seen in the table, especially in that first nine months after the switch from TDF to TAF 
of at least um, uh, two kilograms per year and more in the INSTEES 2.64 kilograms per year um, uh, with the combination again of the TAF and INSTEES, but it's the TAF was the key exposure of interest. And then when they just looked at specific INSTEES, because everyone is interested in looking at the, the specific uh, integrase inhibitor, it does look like, um, again, we didn't have data here on Bictegravir because that was a relatively new drug uh, for this observational cohort. Um, but it looked like dolotegravir was more associated in combination with TAF um, with that weight gain, as was elvitegravir, uh, which is boosted and less so with raltegravir. And, um, and then this actually shows um, if you even switch the INSTI uh, in, and um, at the same time that you switch from TDF to TAF, what are the effects on weight? And that really does just seem to be a synergistic relationship. There are higher amounts of weight gain when you make both switches at once, the TAF and the INSTI. And you can see that's highest in this case for the combination of Bictegravir and TAF. So it really does look like Bictegravir and TAF, like your patient is on in this particular case, um, is associated with weight gain. Looks like 4.47 kilograms over the first um, nine months, which is actually consistent with his reported weight gain. Um, and so in this case, what did we do? Well, the combination of INSTI and TAF has been associated with weight gain. There's no evidence yet that switching off will lead to weight loss. There is some accumulating evidence of metabolic effects from this type of weight gain from the combination of INSTEs and TAF um, with Bectegravir, at least in the opera cohort, showing more effects. Um, and those metabolic effects, of course, that we're most concerned about is cardiovascular disease, diabetes. And so Draverine, or at least the NNRTIs, have been least associated with this question of weight gain, especially when combination with TDF, which Draverine is combined with. And there is an ACTG study that has been designed and is currently enrolling to look at if weight loss occurs with switching people off that big TAF FTC in this particular case and onto Draverine TDF FTC. So your patient in this case chooses to enroll in the trial. So second case, 27-year-old woman with HIV diagnosed three years ago on dolotegavir-based regimen ever since. She's very excited because she and her husband are planning to conceive, but she asks if there are any problems with her current regimen and any risks to the baby. And really, I wanna just lay to rest now with giving you the final data from the Tisamo cohort, any question of dolotegravir being um, associated with neural tube defects. That question is now over and we can proceed with dolotegravir in women of childbearing age. To remember our history on this, in May 2018, the Botswana Tisamo cohort did actually find a signal with uh, women who were on dolotegravir-based regimens versus efavirenz-based regimens in this observational cohort and a signal towards babies born with more neural tube defects. An analysis a year later in that cohort showed the signal had decreased, but hadn't gone totally away. And now we have data presented here from AIDS 2020 in July that shows the signal has completely gone away with, any, with longer term follow-up and more observations of uh, babies from mothers born of, uh, who are on dolotegavir versus efavirenz really being on either dolotegavir or efavirenz gives the exact same rate of neural tube defects, which is very low. And there is no more concern at this point um, across the world about the association with dolotegavir and neural tube defects. The WHO had already changed their guidelines a year ago saying dolotegavir should be used for all women and men. And we expect the European and American guidelines to follow suit very shortly. Um, it does mean, however, that folate supplementation in these countries is something we need to be looking at, and that is really what this has led to. And then a final quick moment on, um, because we've spoken in other sessions here about the long-acting antiretrovirals, but what if you do have a 50 or 4 year old man in this case who is on Darunavir, Cobacistat, TAF, FTC, and he says, you know, it's hard for me to take my daily pill. I'm struggling with my housing. Is there something that I can take that's gonna be easier for me than daily pill taking? And one final question I wanna leave you with is, is it the poorly adherent population that we should be considering our long acting injectables in when they come out? And you know, I think it's a very important question um, that I think there's gonna be two 
populations that are very interested in long-acting antiretroviral therapy. I think there's going to be the highly adherent who are just experiencing fill, pill fatigue. They're able to take their pills, but they want something more convenient every two months, as indicated by the ATLAS 2M trial with long-acting vilpivirine and cabotegravir. We have to make it convenient for that population. Pharmacies administering the shots, shot clinics in and out of your clinic, something very quick and easy for them. But for our poorly adherent patients, I think that we can think creatively about how to administer every two-month therapy for people who struggle with daily pill taking because of concomitant challenges. Mobile vans, incentives to get him to come in every two months. And I think it's going to be a very important and intriguing issue to see the results of the ACTG A5359 trial that will look at poorly adherent patients and that question of using injectables in them. So thank you so much for your attention and uh, see you in the next sessions.